Ella eh, cursó sus estudios de licenciatura en la Universidad de Northwestern y obtuvo su título de abogada en la Facultad de Leyes de Miami. Es jueza titular del Tribunal del Circuito, actualmente preside la División Civil y ha servido en las divisiones de dependencia y criminal. Previo a su actual cargo, fue jueza en la División Civil del Tribunal del Condado. Antes de convertirse en jueza, practicó como abogado por 16 años, tanto en el Tribunal de Primera Instancia como en la Corte de Apelaciones del Estado y Federal, y también sirvió como maestra especial para la ciudad de Miami Beach. También fue la presidenta de la Asociación de Mujeres Abogadas de Miami, sirvió como vicepresidenta del Comité de Quejas de Florida y sirvió en el Consejo de Directores para Servicios Legales de Miami, donde fue premiada por su compromiso con la igualdad de justicia. Fue miembro de la barra del Consejo Ejecutivo Criminal de Florida y del Comité de Reglas Apelativas. La jueza Walls ha sido mentora de Educar Mañana y Hermanos Grandes, Hermanas Grandes. Actualmente se desempeña en el directorio de la Asociación Nacional de Mujeres de Estados Unidos y es profesora adjunta en la Escuela de Leyes Santo Tomás y es parte de la facultad en la Academia Judicial Avanzada y de Nuevos Jueces de Florida. Dejamos con ustedes entonces con la charla sobre tráfico de personas a doña Lisa Walsh. Buenos días. Perdona mi español porque es muy rudimentario, pero uh, es un gran honor estar aquí hablando con ustedes sobre un tema tan importante y muy interesante también. Y yo quiero decir gracias a la jueza Zapata García por su invita invitación generosa para ayunarme con ustedes. Yo soy juez ahora en la sala civil, um, pero antes yo estaba trabajando en el corte uh, criminal. Um, and I, I apologize for speaking uh, to you all in English. It is a, uh, many concepts that are uh, slightly more complicated, but I promise you the next time that I come to Chile, I will practice and my presentation will be in Spanish. Now, the perspective of the United States on trafficking in persons is probably not terribly different than the perspective that you experience in Chile. Uh, despite many differences in our judicial systems, we all face the same challenges. First, how do you obtain the cooperation of a victim in trafficking in persons? Second, how do you handle the issues concerning the credibility of the testimony of a victim who claims to have been uh, trafficked? And third, uh, what are the prejudices or the cultural barriers that may exist in the subject matter? First, for the person who is the finder of fact in your country, it would be a panel of three judges. In my country, it would be a panel of jurors. Second, uh, any prejudice or cultural barriers experienced by the judge who is considering issues of law. And finally, those of the stakeholders, those who work in the system in which trafficking in persons is prosecuted. And so I would like to share with you um, first case studies of two recent cases, one state, one federal, uh, in which convictions have been obtained. And perhaps there is something that may be learned about the successes of these two cases um, from their facts and from the way in which they were presented. And it may perhaps sound familiar to cases that occur in Chile as well. In Miami Beach, there was a man who forced us, many women into prostitution in South Florida and in Nevada. He has been sentenced very recently to 15 years in state prison for beating and strangling one of them. 
The charges in that case were domestic battery by strangulation, deriving support from prostitution, kidnapping, and interfering with parental custody. Our state attorney, Catherine Fernandez Rundle, said that many of the victims were homegrown runaways and they actually were not tra transported or kidnapped across state lines or across international lines. And she likened this form of trafficking to domestic violence where the perpetrator maintains control over his victims by terror and by beating, alternating with affection. Prosecutors presented evidence that Mr. Burton, who is the defendant in that case, forced at least six women into prostitution, all while fathering several children with three of them. He faced similar charges in Nevada, but he was not convicted in that state. In South Florida, the women plied their trade at a local casino and in South Beach in one of the fanciest hotels that we have in South Beach in Miami Beach. And in, nine, in 2011, he beat and choked one of them and abducted their seven-year-old son. The second case is a federal case in which there was a recent conviction for prostitution that occurred across international lines. A Florida jury convicted a violent uh, pimp is the word that we use in, um, in English. He preyed on beautiful Australian, New Zealand, and United States women and turned them into high-end prostitutes. A jury of seven women and five men in the Southern District of Miami spent six hours deliberating and convicted him of sex trafficking and money laundering. Interesting in that case is that there were a number of women um, two Australian women, one New, New Zealander who testified alongside three American women that they were essentially turned into sex slaves for the, the defendant in that case, case. And the way that he obtained control over them is by beating, threatening, and raping his victims. The difficulty in these cases was that in the beginning when, uh, when he first uh, established his relationship with them, um, there was a f affection. The way that the women are initially lured into a relationship with their, uh, with their perpetrator is uh, with a, almost behaving as though they're dating him and he's their boyfriend. Uh, sometimes in a, some of the American cases, there are even marriages that have been performed. Um, in one case, or one recent case, um, there was an Islamic ceremony that was performed between one of many women uh, that were uh, enslaved by their perpetrator in one other federal case. So what is it that we can learn? Because um, I believe that uh, change and, and success can come from studying other successes and what are the common factors um, that can help us to uh, combat what I laid out as the challenges in prosecuting these cases. Well, let's look at the first one, obtaining the cooperation of a victim. In the United States, uh, in, under the Clinton years, we passed a number of laws that, under the rubric of the Violence Against Women Act. One of the subcategories um, of those laws that was created created special visas, and they are called the T and U visas, in which victims of, um, under the U cases, uh, domestic violence, victims under the T cases were the trafficking in person um, victims. So long as those, uh, those victims were in cooperation with a federal or with a state uh, pending case, they could apply for a, um, an exception to deportation in essence. And the, the visa or the immigration status of the victim is often used as a means of perpetrating uh, trafficking upon, upon a, a person in labor context as well as in sex context because the person is threatened, well, I have your passport and if you don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to call the authorities and have you deported. Second of all, in obtaining cooperation of victims, um, in Florida, because many, one of the biggest challenges is um, that the, the victims are known prostitutes, the victims have a history of performing um, prostitution. And in the United States, at least in my state, prostitution is illegal. 
um, there is a method by which now a victim of human trafficking can apply to have her criminal record cleaned or expunged, to remove those past convictions that she um, had as uh, for prostitution or applying a sex trade and clean her record in effect. And that is a very high incentive to, um, to cooperation of the victim because one of the things that she may expect in the adversarial system is to be confronted with her past record. Third way of obtaining um, help or cooperation from a victim so that these cases can be prosecuted is the creation of safe houses or victim services. Now, it is very difficult to obtain um, funding uh, since we are a tax-based um, funding economy in our state in order to provide services for, uh, for victims. We do have a fund by which every criminal conviction assesses a uh, financial penalty against every criminal defendant. That money goes into a fund that is used to serve all victims' needs. We have just established in Miami our first safe house or shelter for victims of uh, trafficking in persons. And, it, and it's a very proud moment for us to the credit of our prosecutor, um, who is an exceptional uh, and very effective leader in this area. The fourth way I uh, believe that cooperation can be obtained of um, victims in uh, trafficking in persons is the sensitization of law enforcement and also the use of victim advocates. Um, law enforcement, and it's filtered down from, from the top, are um, federal law enforcement, one of the biggest agencies, is called Homeland Security. And we think about them as being the FBI or the, D, the Department of Drug Enforcement, et cetera. But within the Department of Homeland Security is a very strong initiative against trafficking in persons. And so they began a campaign at the public level and also within their own ranks to train their agents and their officers in how to uh, deal with victims of trafficking the correct way. They have created partnerships with local law enforcement, meaning on our state level. And if you are not familiar with the American system, we have 50 states that all have their own independent governments but we all fall under the umbrella of the federal government and are responsible for following federal law as well. South Florida is a um, very high uh, number of um, human trafficking cases compared to the rest of the nation, probably because we have a very large migrant community, um, probably because of our physical proximity to other countries. Um, and probably because we also have a very high percentage of extremely poor people that live in, in our city, in our county. It's a very, very poor area, and that makes it ripe for the uh, victimization of women. And so our local law enforcement have created a bridge with federal law enforcement to create points of entry for human trafficking cases uh, to be processed in the correct manner, meaning with sensitivity towards the issues to not automatically stigmatize or criminalize or prosecute the victims, which is an enormous step in this process. As I said before, prostitution is illegal, but there is absolutely no way that you can prosecute the perpetrators if you're similarly uh, concomitantly prosecuting the victims. It's impossible. I had a case, and I'll just share one anecdote with you because it was astonishing to me. And this was several years ago before I think that our law enforcement came up to speed. Um, we all rotate through our first appearance division, kind of what Judge uh, Zapata um, told me that she, the duties that she performs in her capacity as a criminal judge, um, a judge of garantia, and then we rotate or we go through that we will actually sit in court for six, seven hours while everyone who was arrested that day comes in front of us within 24 hours of their arrest so that we may set a bond, so that we may determine whether there is enough just cause on the initial uh, swearing document to even hold them or whether they must be released. 
Well, I had a case come through where there were five girls who were minors, some minors, some not minors, who were kidnapped and drugged in another state, I believe it was Alabama, and then they were driven down to South Florida, I suppose to be set up in a um, house. And so when I looked at the arrest affidavit, and I had the detective in front of me at the time, the girls were all listed as co-defendants of the crime of kidnapping them, in essence, to be used as sex slaves in, in Florida. And I asked the detective, why, why in the world did you book them, meaning arrest them, process them, take their picture, and name them, and include them as co-defendants in the arresting documents? And, and he answered, he was at a loss because he said otherwise they would disappear. There was no other place for us to put them. There was no safe house for, their, uh, for them to be housed. And he, they, they simply didn't know what else to do with them. And in those short period uh, of years until now, when we have a safe house, when we have training, when we have federal and state cooperation so that the detectives know what to do when they come across these cases, then these young women are treated appropriately and they are not prosecuted. And it, and it, it, was, um, it was really one of the worst moments that I've had in my memory uh, as a judge. Second issue was um, how to address the credibility of the victim. Um, it's an issue, especially if the victim has a prior history, and also even if she does not have a prior history of work in the sex trade, there is usually a period in which she is cooperative with the perpetrator. There's often a relationship that she has with her perpetrator. And so the way, um, several things, one I learned from the two cases in which I just read to you the, the facts of successful prosecution um, are how, how is it that a prosecutor should structure their case? They have, um, it doesn't necessarily fall from the sky. Uh, they, in their investigation, they have a lot of choices that they can make as far as whether they're going to individually charge one act of trafficking in persons with one victim who happened to be, let's say, the victim who was strangled and beaten, well, that's an easy case. You can get a conviction there for domestic strangulation or beating. But what if that particular victim has a credibility problem? Perhaps she has a long history of um, prosecution, prostitution charges. Perhaps she has other criminal history. Perhaps she has been inconsistent in the way she has told her uh, story. Well, the way they chose to structure that prosecution is by including all the victims together. So that if one after another, after another, after another, tell all the similar stories corroborating the basic facts about what happened, then the credibility of one victim doesn't matter. And even the credibility of all the victims matters so much less. Because it's very difficult for, a, in my case, a jury, in your case, for three judges to believe that you have a conspiracy of liars. It's more common to believe this has the ring of truth to it. This must be what, ha what had occurred. It is not possible that so many people could be telling me the same story. So that's lesson one, I think, is the choice that a prosecutor or an investigator makes in how they're going to structure their case. In addition to which, the penalties, if you have multiple acts of human trafficking, go higher and higher and higher. There are incentives for a prosecutor who wants to take a, per some, a perpetrator like this away from society for a longer period of time. The more counts or individual acts that you have in the charging document, the greater the chances are going to be that A, you'll get a conviction, and B, you'll get a higher sentence, which I'm sure played into the decisions that were made in the cases that I shared with you. A second way to address credibility of victims that we have done in the United States is the use of expert witness testimony. Expert witness testimony in the social sciences is tricky. We have procedural rules that require a judge to act as the gatekeeper, to not let in all the evidence, but to very carefully assess especially expert witness testimony, to make sure that it is competent witness testimony. 
A witness cannot simply call themselves an expert. I'm sure that I could walk in a court and say, I am an expert on human trafficking, and I think he's guilty. Well, that is not competent testimony, and I would not be permitted to testify. But there have been expert witnesses whose testimony in the social sciences has been accepted and introduced in these trials based on, in, in one case, uh, 26 years of experience with child victims of sec sexual molestation, uh, studying and writing her own book on the subject, uh, working with victims in, in, in a particular area. And so it's an interesting concept to think that certainly there must be people who have devoted their lives to working with victims who have the credentials, the experience, and the know-how to be able to explain to the judge why it is that a victim is testifying in a certain way, how it is that a victim may say, uh, use a term or explain their situation in a certain way, but it should be interpreted in a, in a, in a certain way by that judge. And so that is one other way that uh, United States courts have addressed credibility of victims. In addition, not all of the changes are within, within the court. Many of the changes are what we're doing today, to have a training session extrajudicially, both for the judges as well as the stakeholders. Um, yesterday, I was very fortunate to be invited by um, the, the, for the public affairs um, members of the US embass Embassy to speak to and to participate in a meeting of the working group of trafficking in persons in Chile. And this group is um, exceptionally uh, well advised, um, educated. Uh, the new chair of the group, um, who, whose name I will share with you right now, it's uh, fled my old brain, um, but she's exceptional, um, had a lot of questions for me, but she also had a message that she wanted me to convey to all of you, um, which is that uh, I don't believe that there is a member of the judiciary that serves on the working group, and they need your help. Um, they wanted me to convey to all of you that um, they have frustration, especially the members of the, the prosecutors. There's one prosecutor in uh, sexual violence crimes, and there is one prosecutor um, on organized crime who serve on, uh, on this working group. And when they spoke with me, they said that they, they are very frustrated sometimes in the presentations that are made to the, to the courts, and the judges just simply don't, either they, their mind is closed to it or they don't understand. And so um, extrajudicial or outside of the courtroom meetings and conversations and trainings and, uh, and, and, and conferences like this, I believe are invaluable. Um, I, you know, I don't believe that this is the audience whose minds need changing, but for the entirety of the judiciary that are not here right, right here today, it may be the case. And so I would just invite you, this organization is so fortuitously created and you are such powerful women uh, which such strong voices, and men, uh, that uh, I, I would invite you to invite the rest of your colleagues into the conversation and perhaps have a trafficking in persons uh, training, not only for judges, but also for the other stakeholders, the Office of the Prosecution, the Office of the Public Defense, and, um, and, and that is another area that is extremely important is that uh, we also heard from the Office of the Public Defender, who was uh, present as well. The more educated the judiciary is, the more educated that the Office of the Prosecution is, and the more that we understand the fundamental issues that address trafficking in persons' cases, it changes the arguments from both sides of the courtroom. So, um, finally, uh, prejudice and cultural barriers. Um, one uh, way clearly to address any prejudice or cultural barriers for the fact finder who is also the, ju the judge in, uh, in Chile is the creation of clear laws. 
The trafficking in persons law in Chile, as I understand it, is quite broad in its definition of what constitutes uh, coercion, force, deception, or whatever the pressure is required in order to overcome that victim's uh, consent. Now, laws are written in many different ways, and I'm not sure which is better and which is not, but uh, what I do find interesting and worth sharing with you are um, if you compare uh, the Protocols of Palermo, which um, was the United Nations uh, Convention on Trafficking in Persons, and the definition of coercion that existed or force that exists or, or, or arrives out of that treaty is, does not require solely physical force or threat of death or great bodily harm, but also, and I'm going to find the language for you, because it's interesting and it, it may be food for thought. By means of threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or of a position of vulnerability or of the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person that's targeted towards adults who sell their own children or of whom they have control for the purpose of exploitation. And that was a point of great controversy in this meeting of countries in Palermo because since so many countries have legalized sex work, um, there was a great concern that by containing such a broad definition of coercion uh, that you may cast the net too wide and punish what is otherwise legitimate conduct. The United States um, has included more of a laundry list, maybe that doesn't translate, it's an idiom, but a, a list, let's put it that way, of including uh, what it is to coerce. And Florida as well has included um, you know, a long list and I was asked the question yesterday whether it's better to contain vague language that could encompass a number of activities or better to have a very specific list of or this or that or the other. And the one value, because uh, one of the ways in which you can commit human trafficking in the United States is, hang on. the abuse or threatened abuse of law or the legal process, meaning I'm going to get you deported, um, holding a passport, um, meaning uh, that uh, until you work off your debt to me, I'm going to hold on to your passport and you're going to work in my uh, seafood packing company uh, for the next year on 18-hour shifts every single day without a break until you work it off which has happened in, in our country. Um, the one value, I think, of having the specific definitions included is that then it is beyond dispute that if that act is committed that that constitutes human trafficking. Whereas if, it, if the language that is contained in the law is broad, then that is a matter of debate, whether that is sufficient coercion to overcome that victim's consent. Because, for example, if um, keeping somebody's passport, destroying, concealing, removing, confiscating, or possessing actual or pur purported passport, visa, or immigration document, if that is not detailed in the law, then a jury, in my case, could say, well, if someone took my passport, I would run to the police. I would, I, that's not enough to coerce me. So that can't be enough. I mean, who, who is going to work as a prostitute because someone took their passport? You see, it becomes a matter for debate, and then you cannot, get, you cannot convict somebody of that act, even though that is an extremely common method of commission. Finally, there, is, uh, there are a number of materials. I'm sure you're familiar with many of them, um, and I'm going to leave some with Francisco when I leave here today, many of them in Spanish, both for public dissemination 
and also for use in training of attorneys and training of judges. A protocol or a manual for how you, you might want to set up some trainings um, for a one hour uh, trafficking in person seminar or an all day seminar and who your potential speakers could be and also some other um, publicly accessible materials. Many, many documentaries have been um, filmed about trafficking in persons. And finally, the use of an actual victim. Uh, it's the most powerful way that I've ever experienced a training in, in, in TIP. To actually have a person who is a former victim speak. Um, it, it changes your, it's a bit of a paradigm shift for many of us who are dealing with this issue and, and the easiest way to shift your thinking is to actually hear it firsthand. So that's something that um, many of our trainings have, uh, have, have used to great success. Um, so I want to thank again uh, Francisca for inviting me uh, from Miami. I love your country. Um, I, I'm so happy and I've, I'm so grateful to how welcoming everyone has been uh, with me. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have and thank you very much. Let me put my thing in so that I can understand. No, this one won't work. Give me one moment. Hang on. I can hear you. Are there any questions? No? <laughs> yes. Oh, one second, if you can use the microphone. Sí, lo voy a decir en español. Tú eh, hablaste de que es un caso muy difícil de probar que reteniendo el pasaporte una persona diga que fue obligada a prostituirse. Conozco un caso, eh, pero que es un caso paradigmático de muchas otras, de una muchacha boliviana en España que entró como turista, entonces a un de, en, después de un determinado tiempo la visa caduca. Entonces un paisano, otro boliviano, le dice, dame tu documento, yo arreglo estos papeles para que tú te estés bien con los papeles. Pero esto cuesta mucho dinero. Esto cuesta dinero, y, no sé, 10.000 euros o cualquier cosa, le dice que ella no está en condiciones de pagar. ¿no? Entonces, para no ser deportada, entrega la documentación que este señor le va a hacer y ella empieza a pagarle los 10.000 euros que necesita para poder estar de acuerdo a la ley, digamos, estar registrada. Entonces, el trabajo que debe hacer para pagar es prostituirse. Es un caso que es difícil de probar, pero que es muy común, es uno de los casos más comunes en los cuales caen en, en la prostitución y con gente conocida y con el, los documentos retenidos. Gracias. Thank you. Um, I, I would say that you, you're well educated and you're well informed, so you, you're aware of this, but the, question, the concern is do the fact finders, the judges who are going to be presiding over these cases, do they know this or are they hearing this for the first time? And if they're unaware that this is a common practice, then they may hear it for the first time and, and, and think that it's um, lacking in credibility, which is the only reason why I bring it up and perhaps one of the reasons why it is written into our law. Was there another question? Hola. Eh, mi pregunta va orientada, además de la educación que necesitamos nosotros como los jueces, los fiscales o los defensores como operadores de justicia, sobre la importancia que es la instrucción de las policías, que son las que llevan los procedimientos y que en el fondo hacen el etiquetado de, las, de los involucrados como víctimas, como explotadores y, y en el fondo en ellos operan mucho los estereotipos para... Eh, finalmente producir eh, que muchas de las víctimas se eh, abstengan de denunciar o que cambien su versión de los hechos porque se sienten al momento de ser interrogadas de alguna forma cuestionadas también, no solo como víctimas sino también como que se les eh, imputa responsabilidad en su calidad de víctima. Eso. That, that's a, a very common problem and that's why training of law enforcement is so 
essential that law enforcement is sensitized and it comes as i said from the top down if it is the prosecutor who controls the investigation and how it is that uh... uh... i'm not sure how intake of a case will come perhaps a girl escapes and runs to the nearest police officer well then there has to be generalized training but if that and that officer would have to know this looks like it could be part of a larger scheme or a larger issue to, I suppose, bring in the prosecutor to begin the investigation at the front end. But it, 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 it come, there's generalized uh, training and sensitiza sensitization that needs to occur on the street level, on the bottom level, and there is um, also training at the top level. I would thoroughly agree. Any other questions? Yes. Vamos a hacer, eh, vamos a dar la posibilidad de una pregunta más, porque estamos sobre la hora. Eh, nosotros hemos tenido en Argentina un caso paradigmático, que es el de el caso de Marita Verón, eh, cuyo procesamiento del caso, es decir, toda la tramitación, la investigación hasta la, la elevación a juicio, demoró 10 años. Si sí, nosotras creemos, como usted, eh, que el tema de la investigación y de eh, los elementos de prueba, y cómo, cómo se, se toman estos por parte de los investigadores y del propio juez, resultan cruciales. Eh, cuando llegó el momento de la sentencia, eh, realmente se produjo un escándalo en Argentina eh, porque todos los, los imputados fueron eh, absueltos. Sin embargo, también acá teníamos nosotros un problema con la ley que eh, controvir, controvirtiendo la, el protocolo de Palermo, eh, el legislador argentino había establecido que las personas mayores de 18 años se presumía el consentimiento. Sí, anyway, digamos, en, en cualquier caso, eh, tuvo que quedarse esta situación de este juicio eh, que fue escandaloso eh, para que interviniera la Presidenta de la República impulsando la reforma de la ley. Bien que eh, desde la sociedad civil llevábamos mm, más de dos años tratando de modificar eh, la ley. Entonces, yo también creo eh, que es necesaria la participación de la sociedad en estos ámbitos de formación o capacitación, de articulación eh, regional. Sin embargo, eh, carecemos de los recursos y esta es una dificultad, así que, digamos, es un poco parecido el panorama en, en, de algún modo como usted lo planteaba en su país y en el nuestro, que también es federal, eh, pues si no hay una definición de política pública eh, para combatir la trata de personas, eh, las posibilidades disminuyen mucho. Eh, así que, bueno, más que una pregunta es eh, una em, im, imploración, ¿no? ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Por qué pasa esto? Porque además, digamos, el tráfico es discriminatorio porque somos las mujeres y las niñas eh, que son sustraídas a estos fines. Y realmente es muy difícil superar estas barreras. Um, I'm not I'm not sure about Argentina, but I would imagine that there has to be some initiative like in Chile to create a trafficking in persons um, working group. Um, I, I would imagine that if um, if if there if you reach out and here by the way it isn't only um, Chilean authorities the Consul of Peru is involved in this working group because so many girls are taken across the border from Peru here. 
And so um, I, I would think that it would be welcomed, but that's where it starts. There has to be some, you're correct, organization in civil society um, that brings the issue to the forefront and causes it to become an inevitability. A change or a modification in the law does not help happen on its own because there's no impetus or no desire of the lawmaker to effect that change unless there is a feeling of consensus that this is something that is mandated um, by the population of a country. And so um, that's what I would encourage you if you go back and you uh, speak to your own, uh, your own embassy, the United States Embassy through the Department of State has an initiative on this and may be able to at least put together a working group of all the stakeholders to begin to discuss the issues, reach out around the region to see what are the other resources that are there, and, uh, and begin to, to work on it. That's the best suggestion that I have for you, is that it, it would come from something like that. So thank you all so much. It's been an honor to be here.